welcome to worship at Fourth Church. Please remain standing as we together give our call to worship responsively. Give thanks to the Lord. Give honor to God. Give glory to the great Redeemer. Give praise to the Good Shepherd. Give to the holy all our mind, strength, and soul. For in God we live. Let us worship God. Please be seated. Toward the end of the New Testament in the Scriptures, the Apostle John, John writes a letter and begins with this very profound thought. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all our iniquities. So let us together pray our prayer of confession. Eternal God, almighty God, we call you Lord, but we put our trust in power, money, or adulation from others. We speak of your beloved community, but exclude from it those whose customs or perspectives differ from our own. We speak of your justice, but prefer when it costs us little. We yearn for your peace, but fail to protect the vulnerable from violence. Forgive us, Lord. Extend your rule to our stubborn minds, longing hearts, and wayward spirits until the day your kingdom comes on earth 
as it is in heaven. Amen. The scriptures remind us that if anyone is in Christ, we are a new creation. The old has passed away, the new has come. So let us believe the good news, my friends. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. It is a joy to welcome all of you to Fourth Presbyterian Church on this Sunday morning. Wherever you come from, whoever you are, whether this is a first time visit or you've been a worshiping here for a long time, you are invited to join in this radical hospitality that Jesus Christ offers to all uh, without exception. In your bulletins, you'll find uh, a number of announcements and directions for opportunities. We want you to know that on Thanksgiving Day, we hope you'll spend a few moments with our brief Thanksgiving-themed Rhythm and Word video of prayer, music, and reflection that will be released on YouTube on Thanksgiving morning. Uh, and You can find details about how to, to join that uh, brief time uh, in your bulletins. I included among the opportunities in your bulletins, you'll find that next Sunday, the reminder, is the first Sunday of Advent, the four weeks uh, leading up to, Christ, uh, to Christmas, and our daily Advent devotions. If uh, you do not already receive our daily devotions and would like to receive the Advent series and maybe start a new habit uh, at the beginning of your day or at the end of your day, then uh, these are for your personal re reflection and um, for especially for this season uh, coming up. So look for the details in your bulletin for those Advent devotions as well. Following the service, uh, the worship service, uh, there are certainly people who are moved to prayer and some who would like a, a friend to pray with them. So if you would like prayer from a deacon of our church, uh, you can join that deacon in the stone chapel just to your right in the front here and through that door you'll find the stone chapel and a deacon waiting for you there to, to listen for any confidential prayer requests you may have or praises that are happening in your life that you'd just like to have this special moment for which to thank God. We hope you can stay to join us for a fellowship time right through the door to your left as the, the service postlude ends. And right through that, you'll find Anderson Hall. If you turn right, you'll find a large, uh, the, Gratz, the Gratz Center, we call it the Commons. And that is where we will have a time of fellowship there before going on your way. Um, so um, we hope that uh, we will see you there. Let us then continue to worship God.
Let us pray. O oh God, startle us by your word. Give us ready hearts to receive what you have for us this day in the word proclaimed, the word read, the word you ask that we share with this world. Through Christ we pray, amen. Our Psalter today is Psalm 132, verses one through 12. Lord, remember David and all the hardships he endured, how he swore an oath to the Lord and vowed to the mighty one of Jacob. I will not come under the roof of my house, nor climb up into my bed. I will not allow my eyes to sleep, nor let my eyelids slumber. Until I find a place for the Lord, a dwelling for the mighty one of Jacob, the ark. We heard it, it was Ephrathah. We found it in the fields of Jahar. Let us go to God's dwelling place. Let us fall upon our knees before God's footstool. Arise, O Lord, into your resting place, you and the ark of your strength. Let your priests be clothed with righteousness. Let your faithful people sing with joy. For your servant David's sake, do not turn away the face of your anointed. The Lord has sworn an oath to David, and in truth will not break it. A son, the fruit of your body, will I set upon your throne. If your children keep my covenant and my testimonies, that I shall teach them. Their children would sit upon your throne forevermore. Amen. On this Christ the King Sunday, our scripture is from the Gospel of John, the 18th chapter, verses 33 through the first part of verse 38. I invite you to once again listen for God's living word. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the King of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you ask this on your own, or did others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the religious leaders have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, my kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Judeans. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate asked him, so you are a king? Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate asked him, what is truth? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A friend of mine in Baltimore calls today Christ the King Sunday a kind of red meat Sunday. It's a Sunday on which we pull out the triumphal hymns, roll out the red carpet, wave the festal banner on high, and proclaim that Jesus the Christ is the one who reigns over all people, over all places, and over all times. We crown him with many crowns, the lamb upon the throne, right on, King Jesus. And yet, as we read this gospel lesson, we might wonder if we've made a mistake with our liturgical festivities. There is no festal banner in this story. No blessings abound. Prisoners have not lost their chains. The weary have not found any rest. It feels like a mistake to have a Sunday on which we celebrate Christ the King, or rather in the more inclusive version, the reign of Christ. After all, in this scripture reading from John, Jesus, well, he doesn't look very regal, does he? He has come to Pilate's headquarters bound and shackled. 
His face might still bear the red imprint left by the officer's hand who struck him a few moments before. His eyes could very well be bloodshot from a lack of sleep on that very long and shadowy night of his arrest. And now early in the morning, before the sun had even started to rise, Jesus is standing tired, bound, and humiliated in the headquarters of the Roman governor, Pilate. His followers have already scattered. Peter has already denied knowing him three times. The religious leaders of his own tradition stand outside the door waiting for the guilty verdict so he'll have to face execution. And yet, for those of us who follow God in the way of Jesus, today in our hymnody and in our liturgy, we are claiming that this pitiful, raggedy creature is Christ the King. Interesting. Pilate was just as surprised with the title as we are. When they first brought Jesus to his headquarters, he went outside to see what they wanted. The religious authorities told him that they wanted Rome to put Jesus on trial to keep the death penalty on the table. Rome was the one with the electric chair, or rather the cross. As religious leaders, they did not have the same kind of power, a power that could be used to snuff out life. So Pilate, seemingly already irritated with the whole thing, summoned Jesus into his presence and looked him up, to down, up and down from head to toe. And then he was barely able to hide his surprise and his disdain. Are you the king of the Jews? We might understand Pilate's reaction. Again, Jesus doesn't strike us as very regal in the moment. Judging from our hymnody and from our liturgy, he doesn't represent the kind of sovereign for whom we are waiting. The king for whom we are waiting crushes injustice with the wave of a finger. The ruler for whom we are waiting feeds the hungry without having to bother with the political or economic realities. The sovereign for whom we are waiting is able to dodge bullets, crosses, and grief and transforms the world into the place God promises it will become, whether we are ready for it or not. That is the kind of king for whom we wait. But Jesus, well, he just stands there, tired, bound, humiliated, seemingly powerless in the face of power. So perhaps we hear our own surprise in Pilate's voice. Are you our king? In response, Jesus chooses not to answer Pilate's question, our question. Rather, he offers Pilate a chance. He offers Pilate a chance to discover his own faith. Do you ask this on your own or did others tell you about me? In other words, Pilate, are you asking because you're in a place of searching or are you asking because you need an easy reason to kill me so you can keep the peace? Even as Jesus stood there bound, exhausted, humiliated, his face still stinging from the officer's hand, even then he seems more concerned with saving Pilate than he is with saving himself. I've always wondered if Pilate considered Jesus' question for even just a split second. He had to have been a little curious. This man was accused of blasphemy and sedition. People spoke of him as a threat to the nation. But at that moment, that man, that pitiful creature standing before him did not strike Pilate as any kind of threat at all. He was not one bit kingly, not one bit royal. According to Pilate's world, frankly, our world, if Jesus were kingly, his troops would be surrounding Pilate's headquarters, swords unsheathed, horses stamping and ready to move. If Jesus were kingly, he would have put up a fight when they dragged him from the high priest's house to Pilate's place. If Jesus were kingly, instead of answering Pilate's question, he would have spat in Pilate's face at the indignity of even being asked. If Jesus were one bit kingly, he and his followers would have fought back in the garden when the people came to arrest him in the first place. If Jesus acted like our kind of a king, Pilate's kind of a king, there was no way he would have ever ended up in such a space of vulnerability. Kings don't stand vulnerable in the face of worldly power. That's just not what you do. Surely, Pilate must have wondered, even just for a split second, what was really going on. 
Yet if Pilate even entertained those kinds of internal questions, he didn't let on. Rather, he quickly spit out his response to Jesus like he was spewing out something foul. I'm not a Jew, am I? Your people have handed you over to me. What have you done? Again, as we look back on Jesus' ministry, according to John, we have to admit, Jesus had not done much of what we would expect from the one we call king. He had announced that God's reign of mercy and grace was near. He had called the Samaritan woman into discipleship. He had restored people back to their communities. He had done a lot of teaching about what was true and what was not, what would sustain your life and what would not, what would sustain and give your soul and what would not. Jesus had wept at the tomb of Lazarus and talked theology with Martha and Mary. He had proclaimed that he was the light of the world, the living water, the bread of heaven. He had even gotten down on his knees with a towel around his waist to wash the feet of his disciples, including the one who would betray him. He had given them bread as his body and the cup as his blood and told them he'd be emptied out for the sake of the world. He had promised peace in the coming of the Spirit and finally, In the garden at the time of his arrest, he had actively chosen not to fight back or resist, knowing full well it was leading to his death on the cross. According to the Gospel of John, those were the acts of ministry Jesus had done. None of it sounds very kingly, does it? Had it not been for the people outside the door, Pilate might have found the whole situation ridiculous. Well, ridiculous until Jesus started talking again. My kingship is not of this world, he began. If it were from this world, then my followers would be fighting for my life. For in this world, governance rests on violence or the threat of violence. But my kingship rests on different values, values like unrealistic love. My kingship is not from here. Those kinds of statements must have raised Pilate's threat threat alert level again to high, because after those few words, Pilate seemed to re-engage Jesus on the political question of just who was ruling whom. So you are a king, he asked. You say that I am, Jesus replied. Then he spoke some words about testifying to truth and belonging to truth and waited for Pilate's verdict. Honestly, I find Jesus' seeming passivity to Pilate's royal threat somewhat unnerving. He just stands there, completely vulnerable in the face of worldly power. I personally would not have done it that way. If I could, I would have fought back in a way that would have saved my own skin and the skin of those I love. After all, what's the use of power if it can't keep your heart from being broken? If it can't keep you from suffering, if it can't keep death as far away for as long as possible. Furthermore, if Jesus had behaved in a way that was predominantly centered on self-protection and the protection of those who were like him, he certainly would have made our lives much easier today. For we would be celebrating a king who acted like a king we could recognize, a king who took worldly power seriously and squashed evil with his mighty sword. None of this suffering stuff. None of this king on the cross theology. None of this vulnerable power in power Christology. If Jesus had acted like our kind of king, the kind of king we expect, Pilate expected, then we could sing our triumphal hymns and celebrate a divine power that we understood. A divine power that mirrored the way we like to use power here on earth. That's not what he did. Jesus did not defend himself or even proclaim his innocence. Unlike the way you and I might have done it, this unkingly, betrayed, denied, and vulnerable Jesus chose to receive the verdict and then to trust the promise of the one from whom he had been sent that the moment of his death would not be the end of his story. And on this Christ the King Sunday, I think we are forced to consider what his decision means for our everyday lives. How does his decision to shun our notion of kingly power affect us? What are we to make of a God who suffers and dies by choice? A God who chooses a cross instead of a throne. A Jesus who keeps the marks of the nails even after the resurrection. What are we to make of a God like this? 
I've been thinking about this question in light of the recent acquittal of Kyle Rittenhouse in Kenosha. I realize it was a rather complicated judicial process. I don't understand all the ins and the outs of the charges, nor did I watch a whole lot of the proceedings. I do know that if the defendant had not been a young white male, due to what we've seen demonstrated time and time again, it's highly unlikely he would have been acquitted. It's highly unlikely he would have made it to trial. But in addition to that injustice, I cannot get out of my mind this extreme dichotomy between a 17-year-old kid purposefully going to a protest with an AR-15 semi-automatic rifle and this Jesus who just stands there turning this idea of power as, vi as violence completely upside down. The way Jesus chooses to exercise power is so completely contradictory to what we see played out in our world. It makes my head spin. Jesus makes me re-examine all of my assumptions, all of my convictions, all of my commitments. For theologian Bill Plaker once wrote, at moments like this one in John, we see clearly that we worship a God who chose through Jesus to become weak in power to show us a strength of God's love. We worship a God who chose through Jesus to absorb all of the ugliness and beauty of real human life. We worship a God who loves us so intensely that through Jesus, God decided there would be no point, no place in our lives that did not have God's mark of love. This is the King, the Sovereign, we celebrate on this last day of the church's liturgical year. This is the truth to whom, not to what, we belong. The one whose life in ways we do not understand forces us to question every assumption devised by us and by our world. Until we too see truth through the eyes of a Jewish peasant who began life in a stable and in a manger. The Galilean who broke bread until everyone had their fill. The friend of the poor who upset polite company to plead their case at the tables of the rich. The peacemaker, not peacekeeper, but the peacemaker who believed the only way to stop violence was to refuse to participate in it. This Jesus is our king, not in his splendor but in his suffering, not in his power, but in his vulnerability, not in his glory, but in his sacrificial love that absolutely refuses to let us go and that refuses to let violence and injustice have the last word. How might following this king change everything? How might it change you? Amen.
Let us stand and affirm what we believe using the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, and with the Father and the Son is glorified and glorified, and who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic Church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning, friends. Today is a special day in the life of our community as we recognize those among us who have made the commitment to become members of Fourth Presbyterian Church. And so it is with gratitude to God that I have the privilege of introducing five persons who were welcomed into membership at Fourth Church at a session meeting held earlier this month. And so now is your opportunity to welcome, encourage, and pray for each of these new members. So as I call them by name, will those of our new members who are present please come forward in front of the communion table. Joining by letter of transfer, Tricia Asbridge. Joining by profession of faith, Emily Crum, Steve Johnson, Joining by reaffirmation of faith, Beth Schramm, Patrick Sheehan. And now, Elder Tracy Kugler has a question for our congregation. Will you, the entire congregation of Fourth Presbyterian Church, promise to welcome these new members, learning to love them, abiding with them, including them as family, supporting them on their faith journeys, and encouraging them to use their gifts for God's work in this world. Will you? Well. And now, Pastor Shannon has a word of welcome for each of you. You can't tell, but I'm smiling really widely. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed, we are so glad that you have found your way here, that you've responded to God's holy nudge to make this place your spiritual home. And so I charge you to find a place within the life of this congregation where you can inhale God's grace and love and claim for yourself and let that seep into every pore. And I encourage you to find a place in the life of this congregation, but even more so in God's world, where you might exhale that same kind of grace and love and claim for someone else who may not even know how beloved they truly are. We are so glad that you are here with us. Welcome home. Let us act our welcome with our thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
Let us join our hearts in prayer. We gather together this day, O God, to ask your blessing. We ask that you come near to us in these moments with a measure of your goodness, exhibiting what we know about you, that you are a generous God, a genius God, a God who longs to be in relationship with us. Yes, O oh God, on this day, we ask that your enlivening blessing would come as a gentle rain or a gently falling snow and grace us. For we often find ourselves burdened, O oh Christ, by the weight of so much. We stumble, we lose our balance, and you are the one who catches us, steadies us. On this day, we pray to you that your realm, your kingdom, would be made known in this world that crowds it out by violence, by injustice, silencing those who are trying to claim their rightful place in this, your created order. We pray for those who are sick this day, who long for a day without pain, who fear that all the treatments they are receiving will do no good, who simply want to be well. We pray for those who grieve this day as well, for losses through dying, losses through relationships severed, the loss of hope. Come near with healing in your wings, O God, and sweep over the fear by your steady and healing balm. Do not abandon us, we pray, and give us all your promise tending to bring care and ease to our siblings in Christ and for all who call upon us this day. We pray for this world, O Spirit, you who hovered over the face of the deep, for those who are victims of criminal injustice, for those who have been injured in body, mind, and spirit, for systems that crush the innocent ones, the children, the sick, the vulnerable, both human and the natural realm, Help us to stand up and bring your ease, your healing, your justice. Plant courage in our hearts. Ready our hands and feet to be bold in our leadership, grounded in your holy vision for a realm of peace. Yes, peace. This and so much more we pray in the name of Jesus, the one who spoke truth in his life revealing your power, O oh God. It is through him that we pray the prayer that he taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I now invite Liz Gilbert, moderator of the Women at Forth, to come and present our minute for mission. Good morning. Christmas is a wonderful time for all of us to share joy and shine God's light. So as you begin writing cards, decorating, buying gifts, and making plans to connect with loved ones, we invite you also to consider ways you might share love and light with our neighbors and friends this holiday season. Giving to the Light Up a Life offering, honoring a loved one with Christmas flowers, and granting Christmas wishes for our tutoring students are annual traditions for many of us here at Fourth Church. The good news is that these opportunities to give continue. Your gifts can shine God's light of love on those who need it most in these challenging times. Give to Christmas wishes. This year, your gifts will provide Chicago Lights tutoring students with gift cards and books. 
Wishes can be fulfilled by purchasing gift cards to Target, Amazon, or Walmart, or by donating to Christmas Wishes online or by mail. Remember a loved one by contributing to the purchase of Christmas flowers and garlands that will provide a beautiful backdrop for a Christmas Eve service. Give to the Lights Up Life offering and extend mercy, kindness, and love to the most vulnerable, whether it's hot meals, clothing, encouragement, or just a little extra support. Gifts to Light Up a Life bolster the mission and outreach efforts of both Fourth Church and Chicago Lights. Information about these opportunities can be found throughout the season in your weekly worship bulletin, in the church's weekly e-news, and at www.fourthchurch.org. All of them give you a chance to share Christmas joy this season and to celebrate God's gift to us on that holy night. Thank you. Thank you so much, Liz, for those uh, powerful words. Throughout the year, we come to this moment of giving our offerings with a deep sense of gratitude for all that we have been given. Each week, we remind you through this call to the offering to express our thanks to God through giving of our tithes and our offerings. And throughout these days of uncertainty and unknown, you have come through with abundance, yes, abundance, of contribution to the life and ministry of Fourth Church and Chicago Lights. This year especially, we have lived with our hands outstretched to receive strength from God and to also give with hope and joy and purpose. This is all done in response to come as thankful people, raising the harvest of goodness and grace and livelihood to God. And so today we come to this moment of giving and ask that in prayer and thanksgiving, you offer to God your gifts. You can give your offering at the door as you are leaving following worship through a check sent to Fourth Presbyterian Church or online. Let us give with a deep and heartfelt gratitude. And now I invite those in the sanctuary to stand and join those online in praying the prayer of dedication as printed in your bulletin. Let us pray together. Holy God, you have looked upon your people with mercy, generosity, and love. And so this day we offer these gifts for your hurting and broken world. May they be multiplied to do your service. And may we carry your life and hope to this world. Through Jesus Christ we pray. Amen.
knowing to whom you belong. Go out into this world in peace. Have courage. Hold on to what is good. Return no person evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted, support the weak, help the suffering, honor all people, love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. May God bless you and keep you. May God make God's face to shine upon you. God be gracious.